Good morning, afternoon and evening, uh, audio nerds, uh, production nerds and general production interested folk. I'm going to talk to you today about something a little bit more on the nerdy side of things, but I think something I think people should know now, which is the whole thing with 32-bit computers, 64-bit computers. What does the whole bit thing mean now? So the first thing to talk about, and I'll come back to this in a minute, is that the number of bits can mean completely different things depending on what we're talking about. If we're talking about audio, the number of bits is just to do with the number of volume steps between full volume and silence. So for 8-bit, there are 8, so it's 2 to the power 8 possible steps, which is 256, which is not very many. 16-bit is 2 to the power 16, which is lots. 2 to the power 24 is even more lots. Um, but that kind of gets to the borders of human hearing thresholds. 32-bit is way above human hearing thresholds. And 64, 2 to the power 64 is just bananas and is generally unnecessary. So we'll come back to that. What I wanted to talk about today is modern operating systems. And let's actually, let's just see if I've got hanging around here. Yeah, I do. Um, so this is my copy of Windows 7 which I still use, or at least have gone back to on my audio production PC for reasons of my own. And inside this box, I should find two DVDs. Now this is Windows 7, and this is Windows 7. So one says 32-bit software, and one says 64-bit software. What? So which one do you use? Now, from a 2016 perspective, because this says copyright 2009 Microsoft Corporation, with Captain Hindsight, I can tell you the definitive answer now is 64-bit is what we use because of memory limits. That's the main reason that people uh, started moving to 64-bit because computers have always been designed with kind of future-proofing in mind, but only so much future-proofing is possible. Um, the first computers that were usable were 8-bit, which, if I remember rightly, the memory limit for that was something like 500 kilobytes of memory which is half a megabyte, which is not point, not, not, not five gigabits, tiny, stupid tiny. Uh, then we got to 16-bit computers with Windows 95, and that could handle uh, something like 16 megabytes of memory, which again was, for the time, fine, uh, but then, we needed more memory, and so 32-bit computing came along. And I think Windows XP was the daddy of the 32-bit era. So there was a good 10 years, really, where 32-bit computing was the thing, and Windows XP ruled the roost. And Mac OS X, at that time, was on a completely different track. They were using IBM's PowerPC architecture, so if you talk about old Macs, we call them Power Macs. And I think that was a 32-bit process by the time OS X 10.4, 10.5 rolled around. Uh, that was when they made the leap to Intel processors, which brought them in line with modern PCs. 
So they were on 32-bit architecture as well, because that's what the processors of the time were. The, the processor architecture defined the computer. Now, 32-bit was absolutely fine for quite a while. And I mean, it could handle 3.2 gigabytes of memory. 3.2 gigabytes of memory back in 2005, 2006 was stupidly big. I mean, we're talking maybe 10 times what your computer could hold or more, which seems like crazy talk. I mean, my production computer, I think, got 32 gig of memory, which sounds like a lot, but what if someone said, hey, let's, let's put 500 gigabytes of memory in? You'd go, I don't need that. That's what it was like in the mid-2000s. It was like, that's crazy talk. Don't worry about it. So that was a limit, but that was up and coming because two to the power 32, I think it is about 3.2 billion or something stupid, because the way a processor works is when it needs some info, it says, get me this bit of info from data block number three billion or two billion or whatever. It just, it accesses blocks of memory. Now, if you can only count so high, you can only have so much memory because you can't count higher than the top. So that's when the processor manufacturers looked at each other and went, what do we do? And AMD were the first with their AMD 64 Athlons to really try and jump on board with 64-bit processors. Now the interesting thing here, and this is why we, we still have these questions, is that they designed the AMD 64 architecture in such a way that if you wanted to, you could run 32-bit programs on it and they would just work. And if they hadn't done this, AMD would never have sold any processors because, I mean, hey, you've got Windows, you upgrade your processor and suddenly Windows doesn't work. What the hell? You know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't do that. So AMD made it so you could run 32-bit Windows or Linux or whatever, or 64-bit because at the time, because 64-bit was so new, um, no programs had been written for it, nothing was ready. This uh, Windows 7 disk, which of course, if you know Windows XP, then they made Vista, Vista which was the first properly 64-bit. Let's not talk about XP 64-bit because that still sends shivers down my spine. That was just not ready and then Windows 7 for me was the first rock solid 64-bit operating system and the, the thing at the time was yeah you could suddenly use four gigabytes of memory or eight gigabytes of memory if you could afford it which was three or four hundred pounds at the time so that's like Still quite a lot of money. I mean, it wasn't insanity, but you still had to have some real spare money to throw around. I mean, at the time, a full 64 track mix would probably take me two or three gigabytes of memory because instrument sample libraries of the time were not crazy big or because of the limits of the processors. Most of us were quite used to just freezing tracks in things like Cubase. So that essentially took them out of the memory, which made it a lot easier to work with. So anything more than four gig of RAM at the time was not a big deal. But suddenly things would stop working. Because 64-bit was so new, and all the drivers for everything hadn't been written in 64-bit, so either they found a way to kind of bridge the old 32-bit dri drivers over, or they wrote these sketchy, buggy drivers that kind of worked, but were not nearly as stable as old systems. And that's why you'll still see some guys with older studio computers running 32-bit systems with four gigabytes of RAM in, but the computer can only see 3.2, and that's enough for them, but I think the time for those kind of machines is over. 
because it's been a decade really since 64-bit started to sink its claws in. And it's really not unusual now for a computer to have 16 gig of RAM, 32. Well, video computers can have silly amounts. But yeah, audio computers for me should have a minimum of 8 gigabytes of RAM because now Windows or OS X will take a minimum of 2 gigabytes of RAM for itself because it's a lot more complex than it ever used to be. There's things like adaptive search algorithms where it stores things super caching where it'll store in the memory the last load of things that it's been doing so if you close a program and open it again it's still all there and it'll just poof, open really quick which is great but you need so much memory that it just dwarves the older systems and that's one reason why older systems if you try and upgrade the operating system they grind to a halt because all these new fancy features they take all this memory that that you didn't have on your old machine and depending on the age of your computers, it might not even be possible for you to fit more memory on the board because the capacity of the RAM sticks doesn't go high enough and you don't have enough slots. But I digress. We, uh, let's get back on track. The 64-bit operating systems, if you were on uh, Mac OS, I think it was 10.6, 10.7, they made the leap to 64-bit, whether you liked it or not. As the new Macs came out with 64-bit uh, architecture because they used Intel's processors and Intel made the leap to 64-bit around the Core 2 Duo kind of time. So before the Core i5s and i7s ever existed, Intel had already said, hey, we're gonna be 64-bit too. So Apple went, hey, well, let's make our operating system 64-bit then. And that's done. And you'll hear a lot of people cry to the sky about how buggy OS X was around that time for that reason. But we're well past that now. Yosemite and El Capitan have just been natively 64-bit systems and every driver that you find for them is 64-bit and every program's written in 64-bit natively. So everything runs like clockwork. But you've still got this choice on PC. Windows 10 came out in 32-bit. Microsoft, what are you doing? Why are you giving people the choice to run your latest operating system on a crippled system, for 2016 at least? Why give us that option? Why not just say, hey, you should have at least four gig of RAM in your computer for this modern operating system, or it's not gonna work right. So tell you what, we're not gonna waste thousands of man hours writing a code base that you shouldn't be using. Why don't we just make one solid code base and then say, you need to use this because every modern processor supports this. Every modern chipset supports this since about 2008, which means that you can, I mean, there are computers that the Windows 10 analysis tool tells you don't work with Windows 10 and yet still, um, they're allowing you to use processors that are way older, that should be retired with a brand new operating system. And it's only causing everybody problems. So the long and short of this, ladies and gentlemen, is use 64-bit operating systems now. Welcome to the modern world. Even, even if you only have like two gigabytes of RAM in your machine, if you use a 64-bit operating system, that's the way that everything is going now because every modern system has four gig of RAM or more. So software developers should be thinking, why would I bother writing 32 bit? Like the, the video encoding guys, Handbrake for instance, one of my favorite video encoders, they don't make 32 bit video. They don't make 32 bit Handbrake anymore. And if you ask them why they'll say, well, video encoding takes a lot of memory and 64-bit computers have a lot of memory and 32-bit computers don't, so why should we bother? Makes sense to me. I mean, modern video cards can have four gigabytes of RAM or more on the video card. So not even the main system memory, the video card can have more RAM than a 32-bit system can even see. Ah! Uh. So, 
Yeah, 64-bit is the way forward. Now, just to come back to what I said before about audio bit rates, they're quite a different thing because they don't work in like, you don't get 32-bit audio on a 32-bit processor and you don't necessarily get 64-bit audio on a 64-bit processor. That's not how they translate. Uh, the bit depth is more really to do with file size these days and accepted standards. Um, if we're recording audio into an interface, really you should be recording at 24-bit, uh, not 16, not 32, because if you're recording at 16-bit, you're limiting your dynamic range quite heavily and really asking for trouble with noise floors. And if you're recording at 32-bit, you're recording at a higher theoretical dynamic range than your audio interface can possibly record which means you're just wasting space. And Logic, Pro Tools, Reaper, Cubase, they all deal with bit rates of audio in their own way. And what they do, say you've got 24-bit audio and it plays it through a 32-bit processor, what it does is it takes those 24 bits, shoves a few zeros on the end just so it's it's uh, nicely packed out to 32 and then shoves it through the processor and it works absolutely fine. And it just at the end, when it comes to store it, it chops those zeros off the end again and you're back to normal. Now, it does get a little more complex with mixing engines because if you think, if it takes a 24-bit number and puts a lot of zeros on the end, does some crazy maths with it, it'll come back and it might not be all zeros at the end, it might be some number which means the very last bit, when you round it up, could be a zero or a one, because that's what they do. When If you just truncate things, then you just chop the last bit up and you round it up. And that doesn't work so well in terms of audio because if something's going zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, and it shouldn't be doing it like that. You do get this kind of awful digital noise. This isn't my area of expertise, so that's about all I'm gonna say on uh, mixing bit rates, but generally higher mix bit rates in terms of the engine are better, but in terms of your actual input files and output files should make no difference to you. If I remember rightly, Pro Tools uses a 37-bit mixing maths, which is weird, but that's what uh, Avid do, and it works for them, and you don't hear a lot of people complaining about, about that. I think Reaper uses a 64-bit mix bus, but I'm a big fan of Reaper anyway, but to my ears, it makes no damn difference. It's just what they do. So yeah, 64-bit processors are the way forward. You've probably already got one in your machine, so run a 64-bit operating system because 32-bit isn't gonna be supported anymore. It's over, it's done. If you found this useful, um, hit the like button and uh, get subscribed. Sorry, this was quite a long-winded, geeky technical one. And uh, thanks for watching. I'm Adam Steele for the Hot Pole Studios.